Father, we praise you and thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity of gathering around your word. It is our continuing and sincere desire to know you more perfectly, that we may serve you more faithfully. We thank you again and again that we can call you Abba Father, that you're not ashamed to call us and own us as your very own children, your very own redeemed and blood-washed family. We thank you for Jesus, our great Redeemer, our High Priest, and someday our coming King, for all that he has done, for all that he is doing, and for all that he will do when he returns to receive us to himself. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, whom you have sent into our midst, to be our teacher and to be our guide. We know that without his anointing, we can do nothing as we ought to do it. Without his inspiration and revelation, we can know nothing as we ought to know it. But we do rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory that he is here and that he will guide us into the truth. I thank you that even now he is anointing every ear to hear and every heart to believe. And I thank you that my lips are now anointed to speak your word, that I will speak it accurately, and that revelation knowledge would flow freely in this service tonight, unhindered and unchecked by any force. And in obedience to your word, we covet earnestly the best gifts of the Spirit, that they would be in operation and in manifestation, that the needs of this assembled body may be met in a supernatural way. I personally thank you that your word declares that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Therefore, with great boldness and confidence, I look to the greater one who indwells me. And I know that he will think through my mind. He will speak through my lips. And he will minister through this vessel of clay to your people. And for all that shall be revealed and for all that shall be manifested, we promise and covenant with you now in advance before we ever begin that we will give you alone all of the praise, the glory, the honor, the adoration, and all of the thanksgiving. For we ask it in that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and all who agreed with that prayer said Amen. then they said praise the Lord praise Then they said glory to God, glory to God. then they said good evening Fred good evening, evening y'all <laughs> okay turn in your Bibles please to well let's see Romans chapter third Last night, for those of you that were here, I would like to do a, an extremely brief touchstone review. And then, of course, for those of you that are here for the first time, I'll explain what we're going to, what we have started talking about last evening and what we will be talking about tonight, Wednesday and uh, tonight, Tuesday and Wednesday. We're talking from the subject of what faith is. What faith is or how important is faith? So I gave you uh, some scriptures last night. If you weren't here, you can get the, either the tape or CD, whatever, and uh, be able to plug in and keep, us, keep abreast of what we're talking about. But I want to go back just to one verse, Romans chapter 3. If you have it, say, I have it. All right, verse 27, Paul says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. So we determined last evening that faith is a divine spiritual law that operates in the kingdom of God and it has not been abrogated by anything else. There is no new wave, new season, or new anything that's taking its place. The Bible tells us, we looked at that also in Romans 1.17, where it says the just shall live by faith. And so we found out that everybody in here agreed that we live 24-7, 365. So if the just shall live by faith, and that means the just or those literally who have been declared righteous shall live by faith 24, 7, 365. So I need to know what it is and what it's not. And I need to know how to operate in it because I live my life 24, 7, 365. So if the just shall live by faith, that means I live by faith 24, 7, 365. So I need to know how it works, what it is and what it's not. So we talked about that. Now, tonight, uh, I want to start talking about what it is. I gave you some groundwork. Uh, what did I mean by the word faith? I mean the law, the law of faith. Then we talked about the importance of faith. I pointed that out to you from the scripture. Now I want to talk about what it is, and I want to deal with something that's, that I like to ask this question, faith and belief. I know you've heard the term belief or believe, and you've heard the term faith. Are they the same? Now, <clears throat> sometimes confusion comes because people don't 
understand the meaning of words. I will say something now that's quite interesting, but like I said last night, don't trash anything that I say just because perhaps you haven't heard it that way or perhaps because you might think that it contradicts something that your pastor has been teaching. I guarantee you it won't. It might sound different because you haven't heard maybe the same truth in the same capsule. So you might immediately think, oh, that's different. But trust me, God would not send me here to contradict your pastor, but to expand all of us to go to a higher level, okay? Now, now, faith and belief, are they the same? I, this is one of my major areas of, of, of ministry, not to say I know everything about it, but I know a little. And I traveled all over the world, and I found that people are the same. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter what language they speak. It doesn't matter what geographical location you find them in. Most Christians, and you might not realize this because you've been a part of this particular ministry, but most Christians, they think faith and belief are really the same thing. They think it's the same, just two different ways to say it. Now, we have to find out what words mean, and we have to be careful in getting definitions. For instance, dictionaries. You ever heard of a dictionary? Okay. Most people think that the purpose of a dictionary is to tell us what a word means. But I submit to you that a dictionary never was and is not to tell you what a word means. I tell you what a word means, and you tell me what a word means, and when you and I agree on that meaning, it gets put in the dictionary. Now, if you don't believe it, go to your local library, go to the reference department, and you should find on a reference table a great big fat huge dictionary. Go look it up and you can find certain words in there that are listed 15 times in a row, spelled the same way, pronounced the same way, and every one of them has a different meaning. Your dictionary, particularly Webster's and college and collegiate dictionaries, are designed to tell you the historical usage of that word in Western civilization. So you have to be careful with definitions. Now, I say all of that to get to this word, faith and belief. If you're a serious, serious student of the Bible, particularly a minister, but if you're just a real, real ongoing, hot-to-trot student of the Bible, you probably are familiar with either Young's Concordance to the Bible or Cruden's Concordance to the Bible or certainly Strong's Concordance to the Bible and perhaps W. E. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New and Old Testament Words. Now, if you go to Strong's, Check out the meaning, check out the word belief or believe, and check out the word faith. And you will find that the definition of faith is belief, and the definition of belief is faith. Go read it. Check it out. I was blown away when I first found that out. And then I realized why so many people are missing God's best, because they know their own sincerity. They know their own heart. They know, I believe this. There's no doubt about it. I absolutely believe this. And they think that because they believe it, that they're in faith. But like the old song says, it ain't necessarily so. And I can show you dra dramatically that that's true. And it's important to understand because you can think you're in faith when all you're in is belief. Now, give you a dramatic illustration, you'll be able to see it so clearly. You'll, try, you'll probably say, now, how come I didn't see that? Well, if you had already seen it, I wouldn't have nothing to tell you. <laughs> how many of you, all right, watch this. How many of you came here tonight and you drove an automobile? Okay. How many of you have the keys to your car in your purse or pocket? How many of you, your intention is that when this service is over tonight, you are going to the parking lot or wherever you parked your vehicle, and you plan to get in your car and drive home. Okay. Here's a little test. Tonight, I want you to do something different. When the service is over and you go to the parking lot and you find your vehicle, I want you to take your keys out, hold them in your hand. I want you to climb up on the hood of your car. <laughs> hold your keys up and shout out as loud as you can so that everybody in the parking lot and the adjoining areas can hear you. And I want you to say, I believe that if I get in my car with these keys, 
I can start my car and drive home. And you will be standing on the hood of that car until hell freezes over <laughs> unless you get off of the hood and get in the car, put the key in the ignition, start the car up, and drive home. Just believing it will not get you home. And that's the difference between faith and belief. Everything you believe is absolutely true. If you get in the car, put the key in the ignition, start the car, you can, all other things being equal, you can drive home. But you won't just believing it. You got to act on what you believe. And that's the faith part. Now, if you can't get it from that, you're just plain dumb. And notice, notice I didn't call anybody's name. So, you know, only dumb would get upset. <laughs> But that's so important. I run into Christians all the time, and they're as sincere as they can be. And they say, I believe, I believe. That's why a lot of them they believe in healing, and yet they die with a broken toenail. And people wonder why. Because they never really realized they were not in faith. Yeah, they believe. But see, believing won't do you any good if you leave it at the stage of believing. You've got to act on what you believe, and that's what the faith is. Faith is an action. If all you do is believe, it, it's true, but it won't change your circumstances. But faith will. Now go to Hebrews chapter 11. And when you read Strong's and Young's and all of those concordances, they'll, they'll, a part of their definitions for faith is belief and for belief is faith. That's kind of confusing, see? I'm a practical person, and, and, and I have to have things presented to me in a practical way. You know, I don't need any esoteric you know, planetary explanations. Just give me some down-home, simple stuff that the boy can get a hold of and put into operation. Yeah, I'm not impressed with all of your theological concepts. I need practical things that will work on a practical day-to-day -day basis. And faith and belief, it, they're, they're, like the difference between, <laughs> they're like the difference between a male and a female. And if you didn't know, there's a little difference between the two. Not a lot, but there's a difference between males and females. Amen. Now, let me give you another verse. I told you Hebrews 11, but let me give you, keep your finger on Hebrews 11, but let me give you another verse uh, to illustrate a little more impactively what I said about the faith and the belief, just so that you'll know it from the Bible. What I said might sound clever, but it's not true because it's clever. It's true because it can be backed up with the word. Uh, keep your finger on Hebrews 11 and go to James chapter 2. Now, while you're looking that up, I'm going to ask you a question. <clears throat> How many of you believe that all the demons, Satan and all the demons, are saved? How many of you, of you believe that the demons, deaf and dumb spirits, blind spirits, unclean spirits, all those demons, that they're saved? Okay, nobody. Good. Watch this. James chapter 2, if you have it, so I have it. Look at verse 19. The writer says, you believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe. I wonder, are they saved? No, so they believe, so what? That's a proof to let you know you can believe something and yet it never affects your circumstances unless you act on it. Now, sometimes, again, people can miss it because they, they don't understand. You have, to, you have to search the Word of God in its entirety on any given subject. For instance... Uh, we're all familiar with, with John 3.16, which would sound like it contradicts what I said or I contradict what it says because it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, see, that would sound just like what I said that contradicts it if you just stop right there. But see, you have to put everything together in reference to God so loved the world in order to get the understanding. Because if you go to John 1, 12, it says, but to as many as received him, to them gave he the power, right or privilege, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So you have to have the belief, yes, but if you don't receive him, which is an action, uh -huh, 
your belief won't change your circumstance. Are you, did you see that? Are you following me? So you have, to, you, have to, you have to know that in order to really get the benefit. Otherwise, you can think, well, that, that, that doesn't make sense. The Bible says whoever believes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have to understand that in God's economy, believing is also acting. Are you following? Okay. All right. Hebrews chapter 11, if you have it, say I have it. All right. Now I want to show you one of the most, if not, one of the most, if not the, but one of the most important things that you have to understand and know about faith in order to maximize your operation in the law of faith. Hebrews 11, one very familiar verse. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Wonderful. That's a, I like to call that the biblical, classical, traditional definition of faith. But what do it be meaning? <laughs> in other words, what does that what does that actually mean? I know when the issues of life come flooding in and it looks like they're going to inundate you, you'll stand in front of the onslaught and say, ah, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and all your problems are going to vanish, right? Wrong. So that's the definition, but what does it mean? Let's look at it. Again, one of the most important things you'll ever learn about faith is found in the first phrase. It says, now faith is. When I first saw that and got into this, I thought that I could use the word now because, see, I knew this principle that, that faith is always now. It's present tense. Faith is never tomorrow. It's always now. And so I thought I could use now, in OW as a designation of tense, past, present, future. But someone let me know that that was incorrect. I couldn't use it because it's really a connective word that connects the 39th verse of the 10th chapter with the first verse of chapter 11. A word like however or since or something like that that I couldn't technically, grammatically use now. So I'm a person, I know I don't know everything, so I want to know everything. If anybody on the planet can know everything, why not me? Amen. I don't know if the law says Fred Price can't know everything. What's wrong with that? Don't get upset with me. You know, in other words, I want to be right. That's all. I want to be right. I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to lead anyone astray, and I surely don't want to go astray myself. So immediately I checked that out, found out the person was right. So then I had to look at that and meditate over it. Then I said, ah, so let's drop the word now. Let's capitalize the word faith and make it the first word of the verse. It would read like this. Faith is. <laughs> faith is. Well, you know, you could say faith was, that would be past tense, wouldn't it? You could say faith will be, that's future tense, right? But if you say faith is, that's now. So I was back in business. <laughs> so then I said, okay, let me, let me, let me play with it now. Nah, I probably won't make a good grade in English, but let me pr play with it. I'll say faith is. Faith is now. Now faith is. Any way you cut it, it's still chocolate cake. Amen. This is the most important thing you can ever know about faith, and that is that faith is always present tense. If it's not now, it's not faith, it will not compute. I know you've heard Christians, none of you, of course, but you've heard Christians say, well, I know the Lord is going to do thus and so. Now, that's an honest statement of somebody's heart, but it's unscriptural because when you say, I know the Lord is going to make a way, I know the Lord is going to do something, you have just said by saying that that God has not already done it and his word says he has. So you and his word are not in agreement. You've short-circuited the system. It cannot work. But see, we're sincere when we say that. I know God. I know God is going to. See, when you say he's going to do something, you've just said he hadn't done it and he said he has. His word says he has. Are you following? Are you seeing that? So you have to understand faith is always now. It's present tense. In fact, when you pray, we'll, we'll get into that. Well, don't let me get ahead of the game. All right, let's move on. So we found, we, we found out that faith is a present tense reality. Faith is always now. If it's not now, it's not faith. It will not work. Next thing we want to know. It says now faith is the substance of things. T-H-I-N-G-S, not spirituals, but things hoped for. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So what can we get in a consensus of opinion on the definition or meaning of substance? What, what is substance? Materiality. Tangibility. Excellent. Okay, let me give you a definition and see if this registers in your spirit. Substance is that which can be contacted by your senses. You can see it, smell it, taste it, hear it, or touch it. It impacts on the sensory perceptors that are located in your body. That's called substance. Materiality, tangibility, all that's good. Right, same thing. Can you see that? Now, this is important. Watch, watch this now. It said, now faith is the substance. Faith is the substance. Faith is the tangibility. Faith is the materiality. Faith is the substance. So therefore, if substance is that which can be contacted by your senses, then faith must be something tangible. Okay? All right. He says faith is the substance of things hoped for. Things hoped for. So that tells me then that hope has no substance, no tangibility, no materiality to it until I add my faith to it. And when I do, then I give my hope substance, something that my senses can eventually contact. Hope is a goal setter. It sets the goal, but I have to have a way to obtain the goal. That's where faith comes in. You got to have hope. Miles and miles of hope. But if, you, if you, all you have is hope, now what hope will do, it will affect your attitude about the circumstances. But hope has no power to change the circumstances. What hope will do is let you smile while the ship is sinking. You will go down with a good attitude. You'll have a smile on your face. Instead of going down, oh, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to die. You go down with a smile on your face, but you're still going down. <laughs> but faith can keep the ship afloat. Okay? Now, you got to have hope because hope sets your goal. But then you have to have a way to obtain the goal. Just having a goal and no way to achieve the goal, you might as well not have a goal. Are you following me? So faith is the substance the tangibility, the materiality of things that I hope for. Now, it says that faith is the evidence of things, there are those T-H-I-N-G-S's again, things not seen, things not seen. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Can we get another definition, something that all of us can agree on? What is another word for evidence? I don't know, I haven't found anything in the English language that's better than proof. But now let me ask you a question you may not have ever thought of. And take it out of the Bible now. In any given circumstance, what is the purpose of proof? Validate what? What? Existence of what? Ah, so. <laughs> Think about it. Why do you need proof? All right. Proof substantiates or validates or says yes to the fact that something exists in time and space that you do not presently have. Because if you had it, you would not need any proof of it because you would have it. Therefore, proof is temporary and takes the place of the thing that it is the proof of until the thing arrives on the scene. Did you get that? Now, this is critical. This is critical, critical, critical. You want to get this. This is not something clever, something the play on word. It's important. Faith is the we can say it this way, then faith is the proof of things not seen. Question, what comes to your mind when you either hear or see the word seen? Oh, don't tell me. I know, I know, I know, I know, 
I know exactly what happens when you see or hear the word seen. You think of the big toe on your left foot. Absolutely. That's the first thing you think of. Big toe on my left foot, right? Wrong. What do you think of? When you see the word seen in print and or hear it, what do you think of? Or maybe you don't think. <laughs> don't mean to put anybody on the spot. But, but, but what comes to your mind? Eyes, in other words, visual perception. Is that, would that be good? You don't think of the big toe on your left foot. You think of, you think of eyes, seeing something I can see. Is that right? All right, I want to suggest to you that this word seen, see, remember, the Bible, <laughs> Almighty God is infinite. But he is dealing with finite creatures who are limited. He is not limited. Therefore, he has to condescend down to our level and put his plan, purpose, and will into the context of our finite ability to comprehend and understand. Therefore, God is limited by our words in terms of communicating with us. God is not limited as God, but he's limited in communicating with us based on our language. I speak relatively well because I practiced. I want to be understood, so I make it a point to emphasize as much as I can, but I'm limited. If I'm talking to somebody who speaks uh, French, forget it. And no communication is going on there because I don't speak French. Are you following me? So then we, I would be limited in my ability to communicate with this man. If he was a Frenchman and he spoke nothing but French and no English, I couldn't communicate with him, not on his level. Now think of that. God has to come down to our level and use our language. And our language, especially the English language, is so screwed up. What I mean by that, it's so, it's so well, like, like uh, C, C. Yeah, that could, but which C? S-E-E -E or S-E-A? <laughs> Seen. S-E-E-N-E -E or S-E-E-N. See what I mean? And so it, it could mean either one of those if, you're not, if you don't specify. So God is limited. I said all of that to get to this. I definitely believe that the word seen, when it says not seen, that that is not what God intended to say. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to tell God what he's supposed to say. But well, here's what I mean. It's a, it's a limited word because just as I pointed out to you, when you see that word, you think of eyes. You don't think of your heart. You, you don't think of your lungs. You don't think of your spleen. You think of visual perception. So I want to suggest, like I told you, don't trash anything until the services are over, the meetings are over. You can put it all in a trash compact. It won't bother me in the least. But right now, receive it so you can examine it. Okay? So I want to suggest an alternative word instead of seen and see how this registers on your spirit. I'm going to see if you're spiritually minded. You look spiritual, but we're going to check this out. Okay? Instead of saying seen, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence or proof of things not perceived by the senses. I'll say that again. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence or proof of things not perceived by the senses. Now that covers the gamut of all that we as physical creatures. Because, see, there's some things I can see, but I can't touch. I've been looking at the sun for years. I haven't touched it yet, have you? There's some things I can see, but I can't hear. There's some things that I can hear that I can't see. There's some things that I can smell, but I can't touch. So by saying perceived by the senses, I cover all the bases. Now, here is what's frightening in a positive way. But here's what's frightening. If that's true, that faith is the evidence, that faith itself is the proof of things that are not perceived by the senses, whoa, that means then that in order to walk by faith, I have to leave the realm of the senses. 
<laughs> yeah. And that becomes exceedingly frightening. You know why? Everything you have ever learned since you've been on this planet, you've learned it through your senses. All of our educational systems are based on the senses. You take a man, blind his eyes, puncture his ears so he can't hear, pull his tongue out so he can't taste, rip out his nose so he can't smell, cut off his digitals, fingers and toes so he can't touch anything. He will not know anything that's going on around him two feet from him. It's impossible. You can only learn and know what's around you by virtue of your senses. A blind man can see nothing. I don't care what kind of colors you tell him about, he can't see them. A deaf man can't hear. Are you understanding me? And so therefore, in order to walk by faith, you have to leave the realm of the senses. And that's, it. that's frightening because we're used to everything by the senses. And that's why a lot of people have a real struggle with walking by faith because they're so habituated to the senses. It's not like that's wrong, but you've got to keep the senses in the realm of the senses and you have to keep faith over in the realm of God. Jesus said in John 4, 24, talking to the woman at the well in Samaria, he said, God is a spirit. Now, according to John chapter 1, verse 1, it says in the beginning, or literally in beginning, was the word. The Greek word is L-O-G-O-S, logos, and we agree that that word means Jesus Christ in eternity past before he took upon himself human flesh. So in essence, we could say it this way. In the beginning was Jesus, Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Not God the Father, but God the Son. Okay, so don't go off on a tangent here with me. Okay, now if anybody ought to know what God is and what God ain't, it ought to be whoever was with God in the beginning. And Jesus said God is a spirit. God is a spirit. Okay, and so in order to contact God, we've got to contact him on his level. And that's what faith is. Faith is, I like to think of faith as the sixth sense. It is the sensory mechanism of your recreated human spirit. You contact God with your faith, not with your senses. Well, every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will pray every time. But now what happens when you don't feel it? <laughs> then is God not there? Feelings change. Things impact on the feelings. God is here because he said he's here. I don't have to feel anything. He's here because he said so. If I feel him, that's a fringe benefit. But I don't have to operate on the basis of that. So God is a spirit. And the way you enter the spirit realm is through faith. Now watch this. Notice what that verse says. It says faith is the evidence. And we agreed that a good word for evidence is proof. Faith is a proof. Okay, so proof, the proof means that it, it, it stands for something that I don't presently have. So once I have it, I don't need a proof. So therefore, faith for any given situation is temporary. Okay, now watch this. If faith is the evidence or proof of things not perceived by the senses, then there must be another realm, another dimension that can only be contacted with my faith. And it's true. It's the realm in which God lives. It's the spirit world. It's another dimension. Now watch this. Watch this. I just passed my hand through the spirit world. I just passed my hand through the spirit world. See, we think of, for instance, we think of heaven as a long way off somewhere. I just passed my hand through heaven. It, it's, it's a place, but not a place like we think of it. Actually, heaven really is more the holy city that we think of. But the holy city is only 1,500 miles square. You mean to tell me that heaven's only 1,500 miles square? Oh, no. Heaven is forever. 
But heaven is another dimension, another realm. And I'll prove it to you. It's so simple that when I show you this, you're going to say, my God, how come I didn't think of that? See, you thought I was being facetious when I said I just passed my hand through heaven or the spirit world. That's why when the Bible says God knows everything that's going on in your life. How, you ever been in an airplane, just a commercial airliner up somewhere on 30, 30,000 feet, and you look down, you can't see anybody in any houses. You don't know what they're doing in the house. How can God know what's going on in your house? <laughs> I mean, if he's way off there somewhere, but standing right here, I can check the brother out. <laughs> I see what he's doing. But the spirit world is right here with us. In fact, heaven's all around us. I didn't say that the holy city was. I said heaven, which is the spirit world that God lives in. Now, watch this. This is going to blow your little boat right off the lake. <laughs> You're probably familiar with the fact that we live on a planet. The planet is a sphere, a globe. All agree with that? Okay. Now, let us say, for the sake of this discussion, this is not to be clever. It's to, 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 zero you in, to zero you in on something that ultimately you'll be able to understand much more clearly and be able to participate much more readily in the process of the law of faith when you know some of these things. Let us say that right now here in Arlington, Texas, let us say that where this church is located, this building right now, is right on the center of the top of the North Pole. Just for discussion. This is the North Pole. We're right in the center of the North Pole. Okay? You got the picture? All right, I'm going to ask you a question now. All of us have heard the word heaven, and we all have a concept of where it is. So on the count of three, and that's if we have any honest people in here. Now, if you've got a bunch of shucklers and jivers, then I don't know. But if you've got any honest folk in here, I want you to respond to this because you will see this so graphically, and it will just make an impact on you. You'll never forget as long as you live. This is it. We're on the North Pole. You got it? North Pole. Right in the center. Okay. On the count of three, in all honesty, I want you to point in the direction that you think heaven is. Okay? That's all. Wherever you, wherever you think heaven is, I want you to point. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Okay. Hold, hold it. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Turn it. Keep your hand up and turn around and look. Turn around and look. Wave your hands, everybody, so everybody can see it when they turn around and look. Okay, all right, very good. Put your hand down. Now, let's reverse the order. And let us now say that we are at the very center, and this building is sitting on the center of the South Pole. And on the count of three, I want you to point in the direction that you think heaven is. One, two, three. Now we move to the west side of the equator. And on the west side of the equator, I'm going to ask you when I count to three to point in the direction you think heaven is. One, two, three. It would be the same on the east side. Therefore, heaven is that way, that way, that way, and that way is everywhere all around us. I just passed my hand again through the spirit world. Now, see, you laugh at that. You think I'm being silly, facetious, and all that. But guess what? I just passed my hand through CNN. I just passed my hand through an FM radio broadcast. I just passed my hand through an AM radio broadcast. And you won't deny it. I just passed my hand through short wave, long wave, and medium wave. I just passed my hand through satellite, just like that. Now, you can't say that it doesn't exist just because you don't see any pictures or hear any voice. You've got enough experiential knowledge to know you've got to have an apparatus of radio or literally a receiver to receive the transmission that's being transmitted from the transmitter. Therefore, just as I passed my hand through through AM, FM, short wave, long wave, etc. I pass my hand through heaven. It's all out there. Just because you can't see it, you can't say it doesn't exist. Talk to me. Now, now, if faith is the evidence or proof of things not perceived by the senses, then I'm going to have to leave the realm of the senses in order to contact the realm of the spirit how 
Oh, get this. How am I going to know at any given point in time what's out there in the spirit realm if I don't have an inventory list of what's out there? How do you know what's on TV? You got to go get your TV guide. Check out the day. Check out the hour. Here's your TV guide. Here's your radio log. How do you know? Have you ever, sir, personally, have you ever seen an elephant? Yes. Can you describe, just briefly, just whatever, just describe an elephant? Large, ugly animal. Large, ugly animal. <laughs> Watch this now. I say that the animal you describe is a giraffe. How do you know it's an elephant? Because way back when he could first understand anything, someone told him that was an elephant. So every time he sees that animal, he has the Pavlov dog syndrome. Ring the bell, the dog salivates. See that animal? It's an elephant. Are you here? So we've got to have some way to know what's out there in that spirit world so that when I use my face to contact it and it comes into manifestation, I'll know that's an elephant because I got a picture of that animal right here, big and ugly. I got a picture <laughs> right here. So God has given us an inventory list. You think this is just a compilation of old myths and old wise tales. This is a, an inventory list of what's in that spirit realm so that we can access it with our faith. So in order to walk by faith, I got to walk. In order to walk in God's realm, I've got to walk by faith. I can't go by what I see. Now, I don't deny what I see. But I do deny the senses the right to tell me how to live. Now, when I go out there to cross the expressway, I do not cross expressways by faith. I cross expressway. Ex expressways with my eyes and my ears because that's where you use your senses in reference to things that are in the sense realm but when it comes to the things of God you've got to use your F-A-I-T-H your faith okay you understand that all right now watch this go to Romans chapter 10 Romans chapter 10 you still here I know you already know all this stuff but it's 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 good review it's good review I like it you know, I'm so glad that the Lord gave me this assignment. I don't know about you, Pastor. I thank God all the time. All the time I'm thanking him for the position that he's placed me in. In, in fact, if, if I could, I would pay God to let me do what I do. <laughs> I'm not being facetious because, see, here's what you don't understand. When do we ever get to go to church? Yeah. We're constantly ministering to you giving out to you. When do we get to go? I'll tell you when I go to church. I go to church every time I teach the congregation. I hear just what I'm teaching is what's good for the goose, good for the gander, and therefore I love it because every time I get to teach it, I get to hear it, and faith comes by hearing, and I get stronger and stronger and stronger, and I become dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. All right. Romans chapter 10. You get anything out of this? Yes. Oh, man, I'm telling you. See, the Word of God is constantly pregnant. Amen. God's Word is pregnant. <laughs> it constantly gives birth to new facets of revelation. Yes. With all you know, you don't know all there is to know. <laughs> With all I know, I don't know all there is to know. It's impossible. You couldn't absorb it. It's too much. But thank God we go from glory to glory. Line upon line, precept upon precept. We grow, grow, grow. I'm still growing. I'm in a growing mode. I'm learning all the time. All right, Romans chapter 10, if you have it, say, I have it. All right, Romans chapter 10, verse 8. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. See, the, 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 the critics are the one that came up with this, the, the expression word of faith to shoot down people like myself, perhaps like your pastor, perhaps like with Kenneth Hagin, who's gone on to be with the Lord, Kenneth Copeland, others that teach along these lines, they came up with that to shoot at us because they didn't, they didn't understand. So they call word of faith. Look at the verse. 
You're reading 2,000 years ago. Paul says, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth, even in your heart. What? The word of faith which we preach. They were preaching this word 2,000 years ago. What happened is through the church history and liturgical things and all the formality, they lost contact with this. God had to get this back into the body of Christ because if he doesn't, Jesus can never come back. And so consequently, it sounded like and looked like some brand new thing 2,000 years ago. Look at it. Look at it. Paul said, what does it say? The word is dear. You wear in your mouth and in your heart. What? The word of faith which we preach, not the word of faith which will be preached in the year 2000. He was preaching it back there. Ooh, you still here? Yes. Now watch this. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth. Oh, God, watch this. The word is near you in your mouth. <laughs> in your mouth. What's it in your mouth for? To speak it. Then it says, it's in your heart or your inner man. What's it there for? To believe it. If you believe it, you'll speak it, you'll act on it. That's what causes it to operate. Now watch this. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Question. When ministers preach, what do they preach? Tell them I'm not here. I'll call them back later. <laughs> I told them don't call me. Now I'm busy. Okay. All right, when, when we preach, what do we preach? Or at least what should we be preaching? What? The word. Okay, so when we preach the word, what do you get when the preacher preaches the word? You get information. Once you become the possessor of information, you now have what? Knowledge. knowledge. Now watch this. What kind of knowledge? And what kind of information? Information about the things of God. Now, look at a very familiar scripture. Chapter 10, verse 17. A lot of times, many times we quote it, but don't really see the significance or the depth of it. It says, so then faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. You will get no faith from reading the Bible. What? What? Turn your hearing aid up and you'll be able to hear. Follow. You just read right there in the Word. It says, so then faith comes by hearing. It doesn't say it comes by reading. It says it comes by hearing. Can you hear? Yeah, Brother Price, but doesn't the word say that we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? You are absolutely, positively correct. But notice what it does not say. It does not say study to get faith. It says study to show yourself approved to God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, watch this. Notice something else. Most Christians miss this. Notice it says faith comes. So if faith comes, it must have come from somewhere. <laughs> and it must not have been there before it came there, or it wouldn't have to come there. It would already be there. <laughs> I didn't say that to be funny. It's true. It says faith comes. So it must come from somewhere. And if it has to come, it must not have been there before it came there, or it wouldn't have to come there. It would already be there. Now watch this. Faith comes by hearing. Here's where multitudes of Christians, preachers, ministers miss it. Notice what it does not say. I have a way of reading the Bible, studying the Bible. I call it the flip-flop method. What I do is I take a scripture and I flip it over on the flip side and I read what it doesn't say. And somehow with me, 
it kind of magnifies what it does say. Notice what that scripture does not say. It does not say, so then faith comes by having heard. And many Christians miss it. Oh, I heard that. No, 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 no. It says faith comes by hearing. And hearing is present tense continuum ad infinitum. Well, you said you wanted something deep. I just gave it to you and you, did, you didn't even respond. You didn't even respond. I shot my best shot. You didn't even respond. <laughs> oh, that's so important. Oh, I heard that. No, no. It says faith comes by hearing. And hearing is present tense continuum ad infinitum. That means the beat goes on. Amen. Goes on out into eternity. You have to keep hearing it. Yeah. Doesn't come by having heard. Oh, I heard that. Oh, no, 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 no. That's where many miss it. Faith comes by hearing. So therefore, faith and the word of God are really synonymous terms in the sense that you cannot have faith present without the word of God proclaimed. Amen. And if the word of God proclaimed is there, faith will come. Amen. Now, what does it mean? It means faith will come for whatever is proclaimed. All right, now I'll give you an illustration, and I, I don't know who's in the audience, so it's not, a, it's not a put down, it's not coming against anybody, but it's just a truism, and it's just so, you, you, you got you to gotta see this. There is no church denomination, let me say it that way, I don't know of, and of course I don't know everything, most everything, but not everything. <laughs> I say that modestly, you understand that, really. But you will find no denomination that regularly, on an ongoing basis, gets more people saved than the Baptist church. That's their focus. That's really all they preach. I don't care what the title of the sermon is, it all abounds to getting people saved, which is good. But you don't usually find anybody getting healed in those churches because there's no word on healing in it, so faith for it can't come. And people sometimes sit around wondering, I wonder why God doesn't do this, that, and the other. Why don't we preach it? Why don't we teach it? Because his way of doing things is that faith comes by hearing. If you want healing to work, you got to preach on it. You got to say it. And if you want prosperity, material prosperity to work, you got to talk about it. And in some churches, the devil has tricked them into believing, oh, you don't ever want to say anything about money. Well, then be poor. <laughs> Be poor. That's what you're going to be. You have to talk about it. You have to teach on it so that faith for it can come. Are you following me? So you got to, whatever you want in the congregation, the pastor has to teach or preach that, or else there'll be no faith in the congregation for those particular subjects. Are you following me? Yes. So faith in the word of God, you can't have faith present without having the word of God proclaimed. You can't proclaim the word of God without having faith. You go to some church and talk, well, God's testing you. And so that's what you're going to have faith for, for God testing you. Well, the Lord knows just how much you can bear. So you're going to have faith. For the Lord knows just how much you can bear. God won't put on you any more than you can bear. These are things that are taught today, not really taught, but stated today in churches. And that's why people have faith for temptation, trials, and tests coming upon them. They expect it because they believe that. They've heard it. They've got a lot of faith for it. They have no faith for prosperity because they never heard the word on it. So they struggle, 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 economically and financially. It's exactly where the devil wants them. Because when you're limited in your finances, so will the kingdom be limited in its finances. Because the finances have to come from the people of God. When we were building the Faith Dome, it was a $12 million project. When we were building the Faith Dome, I tried on several occasions. I wrote the Godfather, several letters. I even sent him special delivery by FedEx. And you know what? The Godfather never responded. I, I never got a letter from the Godfather. What am I trying to say? I'm not trying to be silly. I'm trying to show you the world is not going to finance the proclamation of the kingdom of God. 
Christians are going to have to do it. They can't do it if they don't have it. Amen. And the system is not designed for you to get it. But there's a place, as I said last night, where you can operate outside the system legally by F-A-I-T-H. And you can prosper. And as you prosper, so prospers the kingdom. Yes. Amen. So, because faith comes by hearing, you have to be very careful what you hear. Because it's going to affect your faith positively or negatively. That's one of the reasons why I don't like. This is personal now. This is just Fred. Say, this is Fred. Say, this is Fred. Okay, this is me. I don't like sitting on platforms. Here's why. Because I, I've already seen it tonight while I've been teaching. Every once in a while you go, look and see what the pastor's saying. Look and see what the pastor's <laughs> Amen. I know, hey, I've been there, done it. I know the game. Okay. But the reason I don't like to, especially doing the song services, is because when I sit up there, I can't, if I don't know a song, I ain't singing. I want to use my best. <laughs> I use my best grammar. I ain't singing something I don't know. Because I have seen too many songs that are embalmed in unbelief. Sound great, they're melodious, but they are contrary to the word of God. I got to listen to it a while to find out am I going to agree with that or not. So I'm sitting up there looking like I'm totally uninterested. And people say, well, where is he? Well, I'm listening. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> and you might, you might not realize it, but that... That Satan, before he was excommunicated, was the heavenly choir master. He is an expert at taking music. It is a channel into people's minds by thoughts, ideas, and suggestions against the things of God without them even realizing it. They get caught up in the beat, caught up in the rhythm, rhythm, and they're not thinking about the words. But subliminally, those words are going into your spirit, and they're affecting your attitude about the things of God. You have to be careful what you're seeing. I'm very, very careful about the song that is sung in the church I pastor. I'm responsible. There's a lot of songs I will not permit to be sung. And some other songs, I'll change the words in them. If it's a song, no, if I really like the melody and so forth, I got to change words. They got to be in line with the Word of God. Amen. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. <laughs> Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, do not pass me by. Now, see, you think I did that to be funny. The word says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And you're singing, don't pass me by which is an implication that he just might pass you by. That is an affront to God, and that will cripple your faith. There was, there was a song, there was a music, music is, can be a trap. There was a song sometime back in the, during the charismatic renewal, I mean a beautiful song. I really loved that song until I realized what the heck that song was saying. <laughs> kumbaya, kumbaya. Come by here, Lord. Come by here. Somebody needs you, Lord. Come by here. Then another one that went along with it was, let me touch him. Let me touch Jesus. Let me touch him as he passes by. Beautiful song. Come by here. My Bible tells me that wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And you're talking about come by here? How can he come by here when he's already here? And you keep singing songs like that, and you'll get a faith for a God or a Jesus that may come by here. Let me touch him. Let me touch Jesus. When I walked in here tonight, God walked in here with me. Christ in me, not Christ over there. So you got to be careful. Everything you hear will affect your faith 
positively or negatively. So you have to be very critical about what you let into the ear gates because it can have an effect on your faith. And many times it's very subliminal. You don't really realize what you're doing. You get in a habit of doing it. You get to rock in with the music and all that. And you're singing stuff that's com completely contrary to the word. And it's going to go against your confession of faith. And you don't even realize it. So you have to be careful. See, we're in a war. And when you're in a war, everything is important. You don't take anything for granted because you can lose your life. Huh? <laughs> you got to be careful. Faith comes by hearing. So faith and the word of God, really, I like to interchange them because you can't have one present without the other. So I like to say it this way. Faith and the word of God go hand in hand like the wet with the water. If you get the water, you get the wet. It's automatic. I can go to a restaurant and I can order a hamburger and tell them to hold the onions. But I can't ask the waiter or waitress to bring me a glass of water and hold the wet. <laughs> if I get the water, I'm going to get the wet because wet is a characteristic of water. Therefore, the proclamation of God's word on any subject will also produce faith in the hearts of the hearers. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Now, with that in mind, Go back to Hebrews 11.1 1, and let me show you something. Back to Hebrews 11.1. 1. And let me give you the Frederick Casey Price paraphrase edition of Hebrews 11.1. 1. Think about what we just looked at in Romans. <clears throat> thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if you have Hebrews 11.1, 1, say I have it. See if, you, see if you can go along with this. Now... Faith is the substance, tangibility, materiality of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence or proof of things not perceived by the senses. So here's the paraphrase. Now the word of God is the substance, tangibility, or materiality of things hoped for. The word of God is the evidence or proof of things not perceived by the senses. Can you go along with that? This is it. This is it. The word. It causes faith to come. So be careful what you hear and what you let into the ear gate. Now, go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. You still here? Mark chapter 11. Faith and belief, they're not the same. They're two sides to the same coin. Does anybody have a 25 cent piece on you? Quarter? I'm sorry, I know all you rich folks don't have nothing but thousand dollar thousand dollar bills. I'm sorry, I didn't mean I didn't mean to, you know. Twenty-five cents. Let's see if it's the kind I need. Yeah, that's good. Now I may or may not give this back to you. I'm, 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 I'm joking. Okay. The United States government has decreed that there be coinage and paper money produced by the United States Treasury. The coinage and paper money are designed to be instruments of trade. They're called legal tender, old English word. What it means is that the paper money and coinage can be traded on the open economic market for goods and services. I have in my hand a 25 cent piece, one quarter of a dollar. On the front of the coin, or at least one side of the coin, is the bust or head of our first president, George Washington. Commonly in the street is called the head side of the coin. On the opposite side of the coin is an eagle with his wings outstretched. The federal bird of the Federal Republic of the United States of America, commonly on the street, is called tails. Now, if you look at the coin closely, there is a big difference between George and the bird. <laughs> you would never mistake George for the bird. You would never mistake the bird for George. Now, I can take this coin and I can trade it on the open economic market 
for goods and services. But there is a stipulation. Pick up on this. There's a stipulation by the United States Treasury that in order for this coin to be legal tender and be able to spend on the open economic market, both sides of the coin have to be intact. For instance, if I were to take this coin into a machine shop, put it in a vice grip, and grind off the head of George so there's just nothing but a solid silver coin, it would not be legal tender. And no proprietor or shopkeeper or salesperson would be under any legal obligation to accept the coin as legal tender. Why? Because it's marred and defaced. Now, in the kingdom of God, there is a coin that will spin on the open spiritual market. It's called faith and belief. You've got to have both sides intact in order for it to work. Amen. But you can spend it on the open economic spiritual market. Amen. I'm emphasizing the faith part because most Christians have never had a problem with the believing part. Because we believe anything. <laughs> most people, they believe anything. Well, it's going to rain tomorrow. <laughs> going to be down in the 40s tomorrow. How do you know tomorrow had not even come yet? Some dude on the television with a little thing in his hand, click, 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 and showing you a bunch of maps of so-called snow falling and rain, and you believe it and go tell it. So people, Christians, they don't have a problem believing. The problem has been with the faith part. They got the bird all right, but they're missing on George's head, you, when, if you understand what I mean. So that's why, we, that's why we emphasize, that's why I've been led to emphasize that part of it. But faith and belief is very important to understand. They're not the same. You can believe something all day long and your circumstances never change. And yet, everything you believe can be validated by science, can be validated by experience, <laughs> and you won't go anywhere. You've got to get the faith part in operation. Faith is acting on what you believe. You say you believe it, then you've got to do it. Amen. Amen. All right. Did I tell you to turn to Mark chapter 11? All right. I, wanna, I want to deal now with another aspect of faith and belief. Most of you are probably familiar with Mark chapter 11, verse 24. It says, therefore, I say to you, I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. It says it a little different than the traditional. Anyway, uh, in the New King James, it says, therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. The tradition says, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, many Christians, they have a real challenge with that because it's difficult for them to believe or accept the concept that God would give me anything that I would desire. And they'll come back and retort to me, well, Brother Price, suppose I desire something that's bad something that would be harmful to me. Is God going to give that to me anyway just because it's my desire? And my retort to that is, well, why would you want something that would hurt you? Oh, I wouldn't. Well, then don't worry about it. <laughs> you make a big issue about nothing. How, how, can God, how can God say, what thing? Now, not God, but our Savior, Jesus the Christ, is speaking in Mark eleven twenty four. He's the one that said it. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. If you want to buy a little furry kitten for your little girl and so for her birthday, and so you go down to the local pet store, walk in and on one side are all these cages with all these little animals in it. And, and some of them are kitty cats and some of them are little lion cubs and stuff like that. But they all look alike when they're little baby cuddly things and furry and all that. Well, if you can't tell the difference between a lion cub and an alley cat, you better buy your daughter a dog. <laughs> because when that thing grows up, <laughs> it may have her for dinner. Give God credit. He gives you credit, his child that he birthed, that you would not ask for anything that would be dangerous to you, 
that would compromise your witness. So have enough faith in yourself as God has in you. He's the one that said it with things wherever you desire. But see, all that's predicated on the word. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. Go to, go to Psalm 37. Keep your finger on Mark. We'll come back to it. But go to Psalm 37. Because all these things are, are biblical principles. I don't know about you, but I'm sure glad I came tonight. Gone it. I'm, <laughs> whoo, Lord Ray. Mm. Psalm 37. If you have it, say, I have it. Look at verse 4. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires that he wants for you to have. What? Yeah, well, watch this now. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you whatever it's his will for you to have. Look at it. Awesome. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart, not the desires of God's heart. The desires of your heart. Now, keep your finger on Mark 11 and go to John chapter 15. Because many times Christians, they, they talk themselves out of the blessings of God because they just can't conceive that God would give them a carte blanche like that. Well, how could God afford to say that? Well, there's a reason that he could afford to say that. <laughs> John chapter 15. If you have it, say, I have it. Verse 7. Jesus again is speaking. He says, if, stop right there. Stop right there. Put brackets around the word if. Put a dot over the top of it. A couple of lines underneath it. Anything you spit on it if you want to. <laughs> to highlight it so that every time you come there, you will remember this. If is the fine print in the contract. Right. If. If is the hinge that the door swings on. Watch it now. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, or as the trad traditional says, ask what you will, and it shall not maybe, not a 60-40 chance, not if you have a Democratic Congress and a Republican Senate, but it shall be done for you. Now, again, see, we get into this thing of semantics, this business of language, and sometimes we don't use the word abide. I'm not going to ask you, hey, baby, where do you abide? <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't talk like that. That's old 1611 English. That word in the Greek, listen to this, that word in the Greek literally means, abide literally means to live in settle down in and take up residence in. Whew. Boy, that's heavy. That's literally what it means, to live in, settle down in, and take up residence in. So we can read it like this. If you abide in, live in, settle down in me, and my words live in, settle down in you, you will ask what you desire or ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. The reason he can give you that carte blanche is because he knows that if you're abiding or settling down and living in his word and his word is in you, you're never going to ask for something that would compromise your witness. You're never going to ask for anything that would take you out of the will of God. You're never going to ask for anything that would compromise your ability to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never do it. You'll never ask for anything outside this word because you will base all your desires and your the will and the things that you want, you'll base it on the word of God. That's why he can afford to say, what things wherever you desire. Amen. If you abide in me, live in, settle down in, and take up residence in me, and my word abides in, lives in, settles down in, and takes up residence in you, ask what you will, and it'll be done. Because you're not going to ask for something stupid. That's why he can afford to tell you. Back to Mark 11 now. That's why he can afford to say what things wherever you desire. God wants you to have your desire. If God wanted only his desires for you, then he would have made you like the animal kingdom. He would have made us to operate on instinct rather than free will. 
because then he wouldn't have any back talk. <laughs> it is. He just program us. Have you ever seen in recent years any new designs in birds' nests? <laughs> <laughs> Have you watched the Learning Channel or Discovery Channel or the History Channel and seen some new designs in beavers' dams? <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. Birds do the... They, animals do everything that they've always done because God programmed that way. The swallows fly back to Capistrano every year, even the baby swallows that have never been there. Somehow they have a built-in homing device. They know how to get there. The idiot, stupid salmon will swim from the ocean upstream, spawn its eggs, and die. And they haven't changed it. You have the priceless gift of choice. And God has given us his word to influence our choices. He's not trying to control our thinking. He's trying to influence us in a proper way. Just like with our kids. So many times our kids, they think we're putting them under the screws. They think we're trying to hurt them. They think we're trying to put them. Like, you don't want me to have no fun. No, we've already been there and done that. We're trying to protect you, dumb head. You think we're trying to keep you from having fun. What is fun anyway? Getting pregnant before you're married and having a little crumb snatcher that doesn't have a father. I don't know why I can't go to that party. Everybody else is going to it. Yeah, and the devil too. We're trying to influence you, to protect you, to help you. That's what God is trying to do. He's not trying to govern your life. He doesn't want to control you. If he wanted to do that, he already had his chance when he created it. <laughs> he could have programmed us like the animal. He wouldn't have had any back talk <laughs> or anything. No, no, no. He gives us his word to influence our choices. So Jesus said, what things wherever you desire when you pray. Now, this is where many people miss it. It says, what things wherever you desire when you pray. Therefore, it says to me that my desire is to be released in the context of my prayer. Now, this prayer is called the prayer of faith or petition prayer. I have a new book called Answered Prayer Guaranteed. You might not know it, maybe you do, but there are at least, I have found, and again, I say it like this because I'm not perfect, so I may have missed something, but I have found six different methods of prayer, six different ways to pray. And each method has its own set of rules. God gave me this illustration. That's why sometimes when Christians are praying sincerely and they don't get the results, they get tricked by the devil to think, well, God didn't want you to have that. That's why it didn't work. Never to think we could have missed it. Oh, by no means could I have been praying incorrectly. Not me. <laughs> you mean me? I don't think so. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. And the Lord gave me this illustration. Prayer, these six prayers are like sports. Basketball, football, baseball, Soccer, hockey are all sports. They're classified as sports, but they're all played by different rules. You cannot successfully play basketball with baseball rules. You will be called out on a technicality. I don't care how sincere you are. You are sincerely wrong, and it won't compute. There are six, at least six different methods of prayer. They all have a particular set of rules that govern the play. And if you don't play it correctly, you're not going to get the results. Like tacking on the end of your prayer, if it be thy will. That's right. That's right. There's only one of the six kinds of prayer that you would ever use in if it be thy will. If you use an if it be thy will in Mark 11:24, which is the prayer of faith or petition prayer, you have just canceled the prayer. Because when you say if, you're saying you don't know. Because if is the badge of doubt. Whenever you see if, it means you don't know. If you don't know, you couldn't be praying in faith. And if you're not praying in faith, it won't compute. It won't work. Yeah, but Jesus said in the garden of Gethsemane, <laughs> Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. That's right. <laughs> but what, what did he say at the tomb of Lazarus? Come forth. Yes. Well, no, if it be 
The prayer Jesus was praying in the garden is called the prayer of consecration and dedication. When you pray that kind of prayer, then you would have to use an if it be your will because you can't go into the covenant and find that. For instance, like when I started, I was in a denomination. God began to deal with, with me about leaving the denomination and starting an independent church, independent of man, but dependent upon God. Los Angeles, geographically, is a very large city. Well, I didn't know where to go. I couldn't go to the Bible and find chapter 9, verse 17, Fred Price, go to Inglewood, California, to 9550 Crenshaw Boulevard and establish Crenshaw Christian Center. I couldn't find that in the Bible. So I couldn't pray that. I had to pray, Lord, if it's your will that I go to Santa Monica, California, I'm willing to go. If it is your will that I go to Pasadena, California, I'm willing to go. If it's your will that I go to Inglewood, California, I'm willing to go. Not my will, but your will be done. That's a prayer of consecration and dedication based upon a calling that God has placed upon your life. In a prayer like that, you, you would have to use, if it be thy will. But if you pray a petition prayer, and you say, if it be your will that I be healed, you better sign the death certificate or get you a good doctor because you're in trouble. That's not a prayer of faith, and it won't work. And many sincere Christians have prayed that they thought they were being humble by saying, if it be your will. And they didn't realize that they were being unscriptural. See, God not moved by your need. God not moved by your tears. God not moved by your pain. I'll tell you what your tears will do. I'll tell you what your need will do. I'll tell you what your pain will do. It will get God's attention. But if you don't hook up faith with it, forget it.